Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's a real pleasure to be able to participate virtually with this conference. Um, what I want to talk about today is finiteness properties for simple groups. This is a joint project with Stefan Witzel at the University of Gießen and Matt Zremski at the University of Albany. One of the largest collective efforts of mathematics in the last hundred years was the classification of finite simple groups. Nevertheless, we still seem to know relatively little about the type and variety of infinite simple groups that can appear. What I want to talk about today is some work in that direction of trying to understand the variety of infinite simple groups. Um, the tool that we're going to use to understand infinite simple groups is that of finiteness properties. So let me remind you for a minute what we mean by finiteness properties. A group we say is of type Fn if it emits a classifying space with a compact N skeleton. In particular, uh, yeah, so rather than reminding you what a classifying space is, let me just construct an example one for you. So if you have a group and you have a presentation for the group, you start with just a single uh, vertex. And then uh, for each one of your generators, you add in a loop. And now for each one of your relations, you glue in a disk such that the boundary of the disk corresponds to the relation, the word that gives you the relation. And now in order for this to be a classifying space, you need to kill the higher homotopy groups. In order to kill the higher homotopy groups, you need to glue in higher dimensional disks. Uh, and if you can do this using only finitely many disks up through dimension n, we say the group is of type Fn. Now, of course, this space is not unique. If you start with a different presentation, you build a different space. But what's important is the space is unique up to homotopy. So notice that since we only started with one vertex, it's true that in fact every group is of type F0. If your group was finitely generated, it meant we only required finitely many, uh, finitely many loops. And so type F1 is equivalent to saying your group is finitely generated. Finitely many disks is equivalent to saying that your group is finitely presented. So type F2 is equivalent to finitely presented. Um, and in general, it sort of breaks apart a little bit, but one might say that type F3 means you have finitely many relations among the relations and so forth. The point being, at this point, we sort of lose the algebraic interpretation, and these properties become a property of the topology of your group and the geometry of your group. Now, an important feature of finiteness properties is that they are, in fact, a quasi-isometry invariant. It's a theorem of Alonzo's from the 90s that if G and H are quasi-isometric, then they share the same finiteness properties. So the main theorem I want to talk about today, then, is the following. For every positive integer n, there exists a simple group that is type Fn minus 1, but not of Fn. These are the first known examples starting at n greater than 2. It's not so hard for us to come up with uh, finitely generated simple groups. It's a slightly more challenging task to come up with a finitely presented simple group um, that is infinite. But up until this point, if we had a finitely presented simple group whose finiteness properties we knew, then it was known to also be of type F infinity. So in particular, this gives us the first example of a finitely presented simple group that is not of type F3. As I said previously, because of Alonzo's result, this gives us an infinite family of quasi-isometry classes of finitely presented simple groups. This is not the first family. The first family was actually given by Capras and Remy. So Capras and Remy in 2009 showed that there are infinitely many QI classes of finitely presented simple groups. But it's not so hard, actually, to distinguish our examples from the examples studied by Capras and Remy. Capras and Remy's groups have finite asymptotic dimension. And as you'll see a little bit later, the groups that we're building contain the higman thompson groups, which all contain free abelian subgroups of infinite rank. This means they necessarily have, have infinite asymptotic dimension. So in particular, a corollary to our result is that there exists infinitely many quasi-isometry classes of finitely presented simple groups that contain free abelian subgroups of infinite rank. In particular, this means that none of our examples are quasi-isometric to any of the examples studied by Capras and Remy. 
Now with this in mind, um, yes, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention some recent work of Belk and Zarensky that builds on this. So recently Belk and Zarensky used what we call twisted Bren-Thompson groups to create another family of simple groups that are separated by finite properties. Belk and Zarensky used this construction to actually answer a question of Brightson from the 90s. So Belk and Zarensky proved that every finitely generated group embeds quasi-isometrically as a subgroup of a finitely generated and indeed a two-generated simple group. With that in mind, I want to spend most of the rest of the talk building the groups uh, in our construction. All of the groups that I'm going to talk about that, that feed into the construction act either on a regular rooted tree or the boundary of a regular rooted tree. So I'm going to start with some notation to help set us up for this. We'll fix X to be a finite set of size B, which we'll call the alphabet. And we'll let X star be the set of finite words over this alphabet, including the empty word. Uh, so then X star naturally has the structure of a regular rooted tree. Uh, the way this works is my root corresponds to the empty set. My words of length one correspond to uh, the words of distance one from the root. My words of length two correspond to uh, the vertices that are distance two away from my root and so forth. So in this way, if we take X to be the set zero and one, what we get is we get the infinite binary tree. Um, Generally, we'll take X to be the set 0 through D minus 1 when we're working with a D area alphabet. Uh, an automorphism of the D area tree is defined to be just a bijection from the vertices of the tree to the vertices of the tree, which preserve the edge incidences. Um, notice that there are some natural consequences to this definition. In particular, the root of my D area tree has degree D, whereas all of the other vertices have degree D plus 1. So this means that any automorphism of the tree necessarily fixes the root. And this also says that if we have two words that, have, that share a prefix, their image under an automorphism will share a prefix of the same length. What this means is we can start at the tree, top of the tree and move down the tree, understanding what the automorphism is doing piece by piece. We'll start by first knowing how it permutes the trees uh, rooted at the top level and we then move down the tree. For a vertex V, notice there is a natural isomorphism from the full subtree rooted at that vertex to the original tree we started with. If we look at all of the vertices descending from this one fixed vert vertex, uh, we see that it gives us another infinite D area tree. So in particular, our tree has a somewhat fractal-like structure to it. So now, the way we'll describe an automorphism, so given any uh, U and X star and any X in the alphabet and any automorphism of the tree, which we'll call G, we can describe the action of G on the word XU by how it permutes the first letter of the alphabet, by how it permutes the first letter of the word, uh, and then how it acts on the remaining word. So pi sub g here is going to be a permutation of my alphabet, and g sub x is going to be another automorphism of my infinite d area tree, but we'll be thinking about it as acting on the subtree rooted at the vertex x. This uh, g sub x, it depends only on x, and g sub x is called the state of g at the vertex x. We can also extend any action of the automorphism of the tree to an action on the boundary of the tree, um, this will be the set of infinite words over my alphabet. Now, infinite sequences over a finite alphabet can be naturally understood as a canter space. And so when we extend this action to the boundary of the tree, what we get here is we get actually a group of homeo we get a group of homeomorphisms of the canter space. So this way of understanding the states of an automorphism, what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to decompose any automorphism of the tree as a permutation of the top level plus the set of states uh, G1 through GD, where each of the GIs is an, again in the automorphism group of the tree, and these will be the states of G at each of the vert vertices at the top level.
Now, I'll say a subgroup of the automorphism group of a tree is self-similar if for every element of the group, the state of G at uh, the vertex X is back in the original group G. A group of automorphisms is also called finite state if each element in the group has only finitely many states when we start decomposing and moving down the tree. Um, so these definitions are somewhat abstract, so I want to go through a concrete example of a self-similar and finite state group. So the most famous example of such a group is that of the Gerorchik group. The Gerorchik group was introduced in the 80s by Gerorchik. Uh, it was the first example of an amenable but not elementary amenable group. It was the first example of a group of intermediate growth, um, and it also gives us a very nice example of an infinite torsion group. So in particular, every element of the group has order a power of two. Uh, so the Gerorgic group acts on the binary tree. So we'll take X to be the set zero and one. And the group has four generators. So we usually call these generators A, B, C, and D. And to describe these generators, we're gonna let sigma be the non-trivial permutation zero and one. And then A is defined recursively to be the non-trivial permutation at the top, followed by the first level states of the identity and the identity. B, on the other hand, is going to act trivially on the vertices of length one. And so we'll leave that permutation at the top alone. And then it acts as A on the left subtree and C on the right subtree. The element C also acts trivially at the top and then acts as A and D. And finally, D acts trivially at the top and acts as, as the identity and B. Now, we want to make this more precise what this means. Uh, and so uh, let's take the element B and let's actually trace it out on my binary tree. So B, according to this definition, has no permutation at the top. It leaves that alone, but then it acts as A and C on the first level. So now we go back to our list and we see what A and C say to do. So A here is going to permute the immediate uh, subtrees below it, but then it doesn't do anything more, whereas C, on the other hand, leaves the subtrees below immediately alone, but then acts as A and D. And now we go back to our list again, and A is going to say we're going to permute these two subtrees. D says we're going to act as uh, the identity and B. And now we're sort of back where we started, and so we can continue to trace this out down the tree and describe exactly what this automorphism is doing piece by piece down the tree. Notice that the Gerorgic group is self-similar. If we look at any of the states of this element B that we just traced out, we see that the states that we're going to see along the way are either A, B, C, D, or the identity. So at most, we see five unique states, and that's going to be true for all of my generators here. Um, so what this means is not only is this self-similar, but it's finite state. Uh, the thing to check is that if you take the product of two finite state automorphisms, you indeed get another finite state automorphism. Um, good. So sort of an important feature of these finite state self-similar groups is that you can build a generating set which is state closed. What I mean by that is if we take any one of our generators here and we take any of its states, not only do we get back into the Gerorgic group, but we get back into our generating set. This can always be done for a self-similar and finite state group. And this is going to be important for us in our construction a bit later when we are trying to force the finiteness properties we want on our groups. All right, so now I want to define uh, the Higman-Thompson group B sub D. So again, the Higman-Thompson groups are going to act on the boundary of the tree, so we're going to maintain the same notation we had before. For a vertex V and X star, we're going to define the cone at V to be the set of points in the boundary that have V as a prefix. In other words, it's going to be the set of words VW with W a point in the boundary. The name cone comes up here because if we, again, draw our tree here, let's say this is my vertex V, 
then the cone here is the set of all points which pass uh, through this vertex V. It's going to be all the points in the boundary of the tree that pass through that vertex. This now lets us define the higman thompson groups. So the way this works is if we consider two partitions of the boundary of the cones, so let's call these two partitions V1 through VT and U1 through UT, then we can define a mapping from the boundary of the tree to the boundary of the tree uh, just by taking any word that begins with VI and replacing that prefix with the prefix UI. Then the set of all such mappings is the higman thompson group V sub D, where again, D here is just the um, size of my alphabet. So again, what this means is we're considering all possible partitions of the boundary into cones, and we're considering these mappings that do this prefix replacement uh, between pairs of partitions. All right, so I want to describe a sample element in V sub D. So a very a useful way of describing these elements is through something called strand diagrams. So again, I'm going to, rather than define this, I'm just going to do an example. So the way these strand diagrams work is we're going to consider, say, a sample element in my hickman thompson group. Let's say it's the element that maps the cone 0, 0 to the cone 1, 0. Let's say it maps the cone 0, 1 to the cone 0 and the cone 1 to the cone 1, 1. All right. So, uh, so the way we're going to draw the strand diagram is we're going to have two finite trees whose leaves correspond to the domain and codomain cones. So my, uh, my domain tree here is going to look like this. And so that my three leaves in my tree are exactly 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1. And then I'm going to draw a matching tree, but this time in terms of my codomain so that the leaves of this tree are 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. All right, and so we're going to draw the codomain tree upside down, as you can see here. And now we just connect the leaves of these two trees corresponding to uh, the way this function tells us to do. So 0, 0 is going to map to 1, 0. So I'm just going to draw a connector here. 0, 1 is going to map to 0. So I draw a connector here, and 1 maps to 1, 1. So I want to note here that, in fact, uh, this description of my element of V sub D as a strand diagram, it's not unique. There are, in fact, more than one strand diagram that represent the same element. Um, so for instance, if I take this very last cone and I divide it into two pieces, so let's say 1, if I break it into two pieces, it becomes 1, 0 and 1, 1. And I do the same to my matching codomain tree, and I get 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Then if I map these two individual halves directly across, this corresponds to the same function on the boundary of the tree. But in terms of the strand diagram, it corresponds to putting an extra breakpoint in both my top and bottom trees and connecting these pieces directly. So what that means is when we talk about these strand diagrams as representatives of elements in my higman thompson group, I really have to talk about equivalence classes of diagrams. Where the equivalence relation is the equivalence relation generated by the splitting operation. All right, so now that we have our self-similar groups and we have our hickman thompson groups, we're now ready to build the groups that show up in the construction. So uh, in the groups that we're going to consider are what are called rover nekrashevich groups. So the way this works is we're going to fix a self-similar group G. Now, since this group acts on the boundary of the tree and the same, and also since the hickman thompson groups act on the boundary of the tree, we can naturally compose these groups together uh, and form the rover nekrashevich group VD of G. More precisely, if we take two partitions of the boundary into cones, say V1 through VT and U1 through UT, and we likewise choose T elements from my self-similar group G, 
then we can define the mapping on the boundary, which first does this prefix replacement. So we're going to take the prefix replacement bi and replace it with the prefix ui. And then we're going to act on the remaining word by the self-similar group D element gi. Then if we consider the set of all such mappings of this form, we'll call this the rover nefershevich group vd of g. All right. Uh, so we can think about elements in the rover nefershevich group also using strand diagrams. So let me start by first drawing the same strand diagram we had before. So as before, uh, right, so we had the strand diagram where we connected these individual pieces, but now for uh, the self-similar group, we need to choose three elements, G, H, and K, in the self-similar group G, and what that's going to correspond to in my strand diagram is just adding in a labeling of G, H, and K. So now uh, we also have to understand, remember these strand diagrams, we have to think about them as equivalence classes of strand diagrams. So we have to understand what happens when we introduce an extra split. So let's imagine we introduce an extra split and let's say that K splits apart as the non-trivial permutation in K1 and K2. What that's gonna to correspond to here in my new strand diagram, when I introduce this extra split point, Rather than just connecting the two individual pieces directly, I'm going to introduce this permutation, which corresponds to my sigma, and then I'm going to label by K1 and K2, while maintaining my G and H on the other two, um, at the other two points. So now this is how uh, we'll work with equivalence classes of these strand diagrams. All right, so now that we have rover necker shavis groups, I want to talk, how, talk to you about how we actually uh, get them to have the right finiteness properties. The first step in doing this is to start with a self-similar finite state group, which uh, we'll call G sub n, which is going to be of type Fn minus 1, but not Fn. Fortunately for us, this was given to us by Bartholdi, Neuhauser, and Willows in 2008, and more recently by Koklukova and Siki in 2017. Um, so in both of these cases, they are studying certain metabelian S arithmetic groups. These groups were known to have the right finiteness properties, and they were shown then in these papers to actually act self-similarly on a tree. And it turns out that the action is actually a uh, finite state also. So now that we have the self-similar group with the right finiteness properties, our goal is to force these finiteness properties onto the rover nekrachevich group. The positive direction we can do using Brown's criterion. Brown's criterion says let n be a natural number and assume that a group G acts on an n minus 1 connected CW complex. Assume that the stabilizer of every P cell of the complex is of type Fn minus P. Now let X sub R be a G co-compact filtration of X. Then G is a type Fn if and only if this filtration is essentially n minus 1 connected. Now we can combine this uh, Brown's criterion with Vesvina Brady Morse theory and apply it to what's called the Stein Farley complex, uh, which this group naturally acts on to induce the positive finiteness properties onto the Rover Nekrashevich group. The negative finiteness properties is slightly more challenging. To force the negative finiteness properties, we're going to need what's called a quasi retract. So let H and Q be finitely generated group equipped with their word metrics respectively. Then if there exists CD Lipschitz functions R from H to Q and iota from Q to H, such that, uh, such that the distance of R iota of X from X is less than or equal to D for all X and Q, then we call Q a quasi retract of the group H and we call R the quasi retraction. What you can think about this as is this is the same as a retract in group theory where our functions are homomorphisms, except now instead of homomorphisms, we're replacing the functions with C.D. Lipschitz functions. So uh, in this paper by Alonzo's where he shows that finiteness properties are quasi-isometry invariant, he also proves that if H and Q are finitely generating groups, such that if Q is a quasi-retract of H, if H is of type Fn, then if H is of type Fn, then so is Q. So in particular, if we can get a quasi-retract from our Rover-Nekrashevich group onto a group that is not of type Fn, 
It will make it so that our rover and Fish group is not of type F and auto. And I claim that we can actually do this. All right, so now what we need to do uh, to use Alonzo's theorem is we need to construct a quasi-retract from a group that is not of type FN from our rover necrochevich group to a group that is not of type FN. And we have a group that is not of type FN, specifically the self-similar group we started with. So to do this, first we need to actually alter the action of our self-similar group just a little bit. So let's say that the self-similar group acts on the, T, the D area tree. And let's say the elements G and my self-similar group is given by the recursive definition that uh, we have this permutation at the top and then G1 through GD. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this self-similar group act on the D plus one area tree. And the way we'll do this is we'll take G, we'll keep the same permutation at the top, whatever permutation we had for it on the D area tree. We'll keep that same permutation on the D plus one area tree, just acting on the first D letters. Then in the coordinates, we're gonna act similarly as G1 through GD. So we won't change these first D coordinates at all. They'll just only be acting on the letters, on the first D letters of my alphabet. But in my last coordinate, I'm gonna repeat the element G. So notice that what I have here, notice that what I have here is I have G showing up here and I have G again showing up in my last coordinate. So I'm just repeating the action of my automorphism again on this extra coordinate that we created. So once we have that, we can actually then build, uh, we can then build the quasi retract um, from our self-similar group from our uh, rover and Ekoshevich group onto our self-similar group. So what that means now is I need a function that goes from Gn to Vd plus one of Gn. And I need a function that goes the other way. I need a function that goes from Vd plus one of Gn to Gn. Such that the composition here doesn't change our distances very much. So the way this will work is I take G and my self-similar group and what I'm gonna map it to here is I'm gonna map it to the strand diagram where I just have a single carrot on the top and bottom, and I just put, place my element G on the right side here. Now, this function here is a straight homomorphism, actually. And so it's not so hard to check that it's CD Lipschitz because all homomorphisms then are actually CD Lipschitz themselves. But uh, the function the other way is a bit more complicated. So what will happen here is if we take some arbitrary strand diagram here, let's say it has elements labeled G1 through GK, then the map to the self-similar group that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just read off whatever coordinate shows up most furthest to the right. So in this case, it'll be my GK. So what's happening here, again, is I'm taking my rightmost coordinate and that's what I'm gonna map my, uh, my, um, that's the, what's gonna get mapped to my self-similar group. Um, it's not so hard to check that, in fact, this function is CD Lipschitz. In fact, if I give you uh, a generating set for, uh, for my River Nakrashevich group, it's something I'm convinced all of you could check at home, actually. So this gives us now uh, this quasi-retract onto the self-similar group that's not of type FN. Uh, and so this gives us a rover necker shavage group now that is also not of type FN. The final step in the construction then is to get, self, is to get simplicity. Um, we don't just get that for free, but it's actually a theorem of necker shavages that if for any self-similar group G, the corresponding Higman Thompson, the corresponding rover necker shavage group, uh, its commutator subgroup is actually simple. And fortunately for us, for these groups GN that we described uh, that have the right finiteness properties, when we do the VD plus one of GN and we take its commutator, we get something of finite index and VD plus one of GN. Now, since finiteness properties are quasi-isometry invariant, they pass the finite index subgroups. So in fact, it is VD plus one of GN prime that gives us the simple group of type FN minus one, but not FN. So I'll end with just an example. Um, so here I will give the example of the first simple group of type F2, but not F3. So what we'll do is we'll take the field with two elements and we'll adjoin T, T inverse, and one plus T plus T squared inverse. 
Um, and then we'll take G to be the affine general linear group over this ring. So that means we're going to be taking these matrices, alpha, beta, zero, and one, where alpha is a unit in this ring and beta is just any element in this ring. This group acts self-similarly uh, on a binary tree, and it's got three generators, which on the, uh, as a self-similar group, the three generators are described here. Now, what we do is we embed this group into the ternary tree instead of the binary tree. So we move it up a level using the description of the embedding from before. And this action on the binary tree then gives us a commutator subgroup, which has index 16 in V3 of G. And this gives us a group that is type F2, but not F3. And I will end there. Thank you.